Chapter 7 Each of us has a subconscious voice, an inner mother who tells us what we know we ought to do at precisely the time when we know we aren't going to do it. At that moment, the voice in Paul's head was yelling, Get out of there! Run away! But it was wasting its breath. He wanted to obey, of course, but his motor functions weren't responding, and the little voice was running out of arguments. You'll be in real trouble if you don't, was simply stating the obvious, and you'll go to bed with no pudding, just wasn't cutting it. The top bolt was all the way back. Now the chains were shaking slightly, as though a heavy lorry was thundering past in the road below, and the knob of the big Yale lock was slowly starting to turn. Not Benny, then. Not unless he'd won stupendous telekinetic powers in the office Christmas raffle. Not Benny coming back from the bank. Somebody or something else. At the very least, you could try calling for help, tutted his inner voice. But Paul could see the floor in that one. The building was apparently deserted, apart from Mr. Porphy Watsit. Yelling would only bring him to the attention of whatever was coming through the door. Honestly, sighed the inner voice, just wait till your father hears about this. He backed away, and as he did so, the sword, dangling forgotten from his right hand, banged against the edge of the desk. Gave him an idea. What on earth is that supposed to achieve, I really couldn't say, sniffed the voice. But Paul took no notice. Instead, he dug the needle-sharp point of the sword into the carpet, then jammed the pommel under the bottom edge of the Yale lock housing. As he let go of the handle and stepped aside, the remaining bolts flew back like crossbow quarrels, the last chain fell away, and the tumblers of the bottom chub clunked into battery. "'Run!' screeched the voice, but he couldn't move at all. He could hardly breathe. The door shifted and stopped." Then there was a moment of great stillness, followed by a loud thump on the other side of the door. Then another, and another. Pause, followed by a tremendous crash, and the sword bent like a bore. The door opened an inch and a half. The darkness speared through the crack between it and the frame. Darkness that was much, much more than a mere deficiency of light. Paul opened his mouth to scream, but the sword straightened up like a spring, pushing the door shut. Paul stared at the point where the pommel was jammed against the lock body. There was nothing holding the lock on except four perfectly ordinary, mundane little screws. The sort that came in separate little compartment in the plastic bubble wrap when you buy the lock. Four silly little bits of metal, screwed into a piece of board, standing between him and whatever was on the other side. They held. Bless them, Paul thought. Bless whoever made them, whoever specified and ordered them, packed them, fitted them, because they'd done a good job in a world far more dangerous than they could ever begin to imagine. And the least he could do was try and give them a little bit of support. Gingerly, as though touching a hot panhandle, he reached out and slid the top bolt home again. It didn't burn, bite or struggle, so he slammed back the rest of the bolts, and when the next thump came, the door didn't flex at all. Next, he hooked up the chains, and mercifully they stayed put. The next assault cracked the plaster around the edge of the door frame, but nothing budged, and unless Paul was kidding himself, it wasn't quite as ferocious as the previous one, or the one before that. Was it possible that the thing on the other side was getting tired, running out of steam? He watched as the bolts quivered a little, but didn't move. One more thump, but it was more a venting of frustrated anger than nothing. At this point, Paul realised that he'd been neglecting his breathing and caught up. A few deep breaths and he was thinking better. In particular, he was remembering something a little voice had said to him about getting out of there, and now he came to think of it, that wasn't a bad idea. First, however, he tapped the sword hilt sideways with the palm of his hand, till the weapon came free and toppled over onto the floor. Pushing out of the way with the side of his foot, he grabbed the big, heavy filing cabinet that stood beside the door, it was a cake box of all things on top of it, but he chucked that on the floor, and hauled it down onto its side. Then he shoved, heaved, and manhandled it up tight against the door. It wasn't much, but it was something. And besides, it wasn't his fault or his choice that he was in the position of defending the land of the living against invaders from the other side, with no resources at his disposal apart from office furniture. He knelt down, grabbed the sword, and ran out of the office, slamming the door behind him. In the corridor, he paused, swore out loud, went back in, snatched the files he'd been sent to collect off the desk, and withdrew once more. This time, he didn't stop running until he was back in the passage outside Mr. Lertine's office. He knocked and went in. What kept you? Well, there was this... Paul stopped and stared. The man sitting behind the desk wasn't the round-headed Mr. Porphy thing of me. 
Instead, Mr. Lairtides was lounging in his usual slightly exaggerated manner, hands behind his head. When, when did you get back? Mr. Lairtides frowned. What? I said, when did you get back? I've been here all morning, as well you know. Look, have you got these files or not? Because I've got a lot to get done before... No, you haven't, Paul said grimly. I got in at twenty past nine and he went here. There was this other bloke, Mr. Paul... Screw it, he couldn't remember the name. This other bloke, short, tubby, round head like a football. Both of Mr. Lairtide's eyebrows shot up. Are you feeling all right? he said. I was here at half eight this morning, and I've been here ever since. You were your usual punctual self, three minutes past nine. Balls, Paul said. You weren't here. Roundhead guy was sitting there right where you are. He sent me to get these files. Mr. Lairtide stretched forward. It was as though his upper torso was plasticine and peered at the files in Paul's arms. Those are the files, all right. You found them on Benny Shumway's desk, yes? Yes, that's... How did you know that? Because I asked you to get them for me, twenty minutes ago, actually. But you're here now, so... He reached out for the files, but Paul stepped back. Instinctively, he raised the sword a little. Mr. Laertides couldn't have noticed it before, and when he saw it, he went suddenly very still and quiet. What are you waving that thing round for? He said in a flat, soft voice. I got here late, Paul said. I had a hangover. I missed my bus. When I got in, there was nobody about. Nobody on reception. The front office was empty. Nobody in the corridors or anything. You weren't here, but this rounder bloke was. He said you were away today. He was minding the store for you. He sent me to get these files. There was a knock on the door. Mr. Lairtide scowled and called out, Yes, come in. And Mr. Tanner walked in. You got the amalgamated mouldings file? he asked. Mr. Lairtides nodded. Just beside you, look, on top of the filing cabinet. Thanks. Mr. Tanner moved to get the file and caught sight of the sword in Paul's hand. Maybe he did a very slight double-take, or maybe not. Then he left, closing the door behind him. Mr. Lairtides smiled. I think you just got to the bit where the building was completely deserted, he said. It was, Paul said resolutely. All right, I didn't search the place from top to bottom, but... Another knock. This time it was Kaz Suslovich wanting to borrow Mr. Lairtide's twelve-dimensional calculator. But, Paul went on, I came all the way here from the front office, then from here up to Benny's, and there was nobody about, and it was dead quiet. Mr. Lairtide shrugged. Whatever, he said. So, you got the files. Why the cold steel, by the way? You got a really stroppy letter to open or something? I found... Paul hesitated. He had no idea why, but he was sure that it wouldn't be a good idea to tell Mr. Lairtides about the connecting door trying to open itself. I, I found it in Benny's room, but actually it's mine. I, um, I left it there a while back, so while I was passing I thought I'd bring it along. Mr. Lairtides' smile widened, like the gap in the ozone layer. And why not, he said. Do it now, I always say. If you leave it till later, you'll forget about it. Anyway, he went on, yawning hugely, you've got the files I need, and you've got your sword back, so we're all happy, aren't we? And now, if it's all the same to you, perhaps we can get on to do some paying work. I could refuse, Paul thought. I could refuse to give him these files unless he tells me what the hell's going on. But, he remembered, for some reason, a history lesson at junior school. Horrible batty old Miss Hook telling them the story of King Canute and the Sea. Precisely. He could stand there and command the waves to go back. He could shout and wave his arms about and threaten to resign and anything else that occurred to him on the spur of the moment. But he was still going to end up with wet shoes and soggy socks. Here you are, he said quietly, handing over the files. Anything you want me to do? Mr. Lairtides frowned and then shrugged. Can't think of anything offhand, so... Uh, uh, no, wait a second. There is one thing you could do for me. Just snip across the road to Water Pebbles, see if the book I ordered last week's arrived yet. He scribbled a few words on the back of a petty cash slip. It's all paid for. You just need to pick it up. Paul nodded and left without a word. In the corridor, just past the Claws file store, he nearly bumped into Sophie who was coming out the stationery cupboard with a large box of paper clips. She mumbled a greeting and scuttled past, her gaze fixed on the carpet. As if that wasn't enough adventure for one day, a few yards further on he came face to face with Theo Van Spee himself. Mr. Van Spee narrowed his eyes. You are Mr. Marlowe, he said, but without his usual ring of absolute conviction. You work with Mr. Lairtides, and you're just going to collect a book for him. They have it in stock, but Mr. Lairtides has in fact not yet paid for it. 
You will give them a check, and Mr. Leotides will reimburse you in cash. His favourite colour is grey. You are fond of creme brulee and zabaglioni, but you have never been to Toronto. The key to the problem that has been disturbing you for some time was until recently under your bed. Now, however... He hesitated and frowned a little. His lips moved, but no words came out. Then he asked, "'Excuse me, but haven't we met before?' "'I, I don't think so,' Paul replied. "'Really? For a moment I was sure.' The professor closed his eyes, just for a second. When he opened them again, he seemed much more composed. "'Your father loves you very deeply, unlike your mother. "'You should in future avoid strong drink whenever possible. And "'The alarm clock on your bedside table is four minutes slow. "'Quite soon you will cause the death of one of your colleagues, but not two. "'Something you are relying on is actually worthless and false. "'But this is no bad thing. You are standing on my left foot.' Uh, "'Sorry,' Paul said, and shifted slightly. It is of no consequence, the professor replied, lifting his foot and wincing slightly. One of them loves you. He scowled and shook his head. No, that is not true. That is, one of them does indeed love you, but not the one I thought it was, or in the way I had anticipated. The fridge is, to a certain extent, the key. But first you must understand properly why you couldn't fix it. You are far less than you used to be. It will be far more in due course. I suggest that you glance at the book before you give it to Mr. Lairtites, and your worst nightmare will show you the way. Do you happen to have the right time? I fancy my watch is running fast. Uh, um, Paul said when he looked at the clock on the wall just behind the professor's head, and told him it was a quarter past ten. Uh, thank you, the professor said. I'm very sorry to have met you. Good day. It took Paul several minutes to recover from all that. Working at J.A.W.W., however, had given him the knack of burying his head so deep in the sand that he could practically smell magma, and by the time he passed the front desk, Mr. Tanner's mum was back on form again, a slim, curly-haired redhead with freckled shoulders and misty green eyes, but she ignored him completely. He was mostly wondering whether he dared make the most of his trip out of the office and stop off somewhere for a coffee and a snack. As he crossed the road, it occurred to him that Mr. Lairtides hadn't specified which branch of water pebbles... He took out the note he'd been given and saw the address was written down there, along with the right department to ask at, and which floor it was on, and, of course, the title of the book, The Garden of Chivalry. Whatever. The Garden of what? asked the girl behind the counter. Chivalry, Paul replied. Or I suppose it could be cavalry? You sure you don't mean landscape in your window box with Alan Titchmarsh? Paul thought for a moment. Yes, he replied. Absolutely sure. Ah, uh, or oh, Alan Titchmarsh's big book of compost. Still sure, thanks. Or oh, an introduction by Alan Titchmarsh with a book by somebody or other. Not even that, Paul said. Sorry. The girl shrugged. I'll see what I can do, she said, with the air of a doctor prescribing aspirin for a bad case of death. But it doesn't sound like the sort of thing we usually sell. Paul nodded. Not by Alan Titchmarsh, you mean? The girl seemed offended. We've got books by other people as well, you know. Baby spies, scary spies. Old spice? She ignored that. Desmond Lynham, she went on. Delia Smith, Trini and Susanna. Jamie Watts' his name with the hair. That bloke who does the weather on BBC too. We've got loads of books, actually. Great, Paul said. Do you think you could go and have a look for this one? She sighed. Fine, she said. Wait there. Ten minutes later, she came back, holding a book and wearing a slightly stunned expression. This what you were after? Possibly, Paul replied. Can I have a look at it? What? Uh, 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 oh, I suppose so. She put it down on the desk and wiped her hands on her jeans. The Garden of Chivalry, illuminated manuscripts from 14th century Saskatchewan, by John Paul de Sosenach. She shook her head. You sure you want that? Paul smiled. It, it's for a friend, he said. Oh, right. That apparently explained everything. That'll be thirty nine ninety nine then. There followed a circular and rather dreary little discussion about whether or not the book had been paid for in advance. Then Paul wrote out a cheque, was issued with the book and a receipt, and left the shop before the girl could change her mind. Out in the fresh air, he caught a hefty reprise of his hangover. Coffee, he thought, and a snack. Fortunately, there was a Starbucksy sort of place a few yards down the street. He bought a cup of coffee and a custard slice, and not because Professor Van Spee had told him to, oh dear no, 
But because he had nothing else to beguile his mind with, opened Mr. Lairtide's book and started to read. Morsley, it was just pictures. A book of pictures of pictures and books, which struck Paul as faintly incestuous. As pictures, they were all right, if you like that sort of thing. Knights in armour and droopy-looking women in blue holding flowers, in the margins of columns of strange-looking writing. Latin, he guessed, or possibly Klingon. Attractive in a wishy-washy sort of way, but rather monotonous after a while. Also, whoever had drawn them had a rotten knife of perspective. Here, for instance, was a picture of two men bashing each other up with sharp weapons on a tiny island the size of a rubber dinghy, surrounded by unconvincing-looking water. On the opposite page, there was a castle, but the men standing outside it shooting arrows and throwing rocks were almost as tall as the walls, and the people inside the castle were just as big, which meant there was only room for four of them. On the next page, a man with a curly beard and two extremely ugly women with wings were hovering in mid-air over the heads of some kneeling people, all of them face on and looking hopelessly constipated. Face in that was a sort of cartoon strip. The same people appeared in each of the dozen small pictures, and one of them looked like he was carrying a building balanced on his right hand, like a waiter carrying a tray. Not, Paul decided, his cup of tea, particularly when his head felt more than a touch fragile. Silly, most of it, and the rest was just plain dull. Bet you don't get rubbish like that in an Alan Titchmarsh book. You won another copy, asked a voice behind his head, conscious that he'd been sitting there with an empty cup for some time, taking up floor space that could have been earning revenue. He nodded several times and said, e e Yes, please. Going right up. You like the cake? Mm -mm. Yes, fantastic, thanks. You want another slice? Uh, no. All right, just the coffee. Paul caught sight of his watch. He'd been there half an hour. Uh, actually, he stood up and closed the book with a snap. I have to go now. Uh, thanks all the same. Oh, you don't want the coffee? No. Is Paul now ready? You take. Oh, no. It, it, it's not that, Paul said, turning around to face a speaker. It's just that I lost track of time and I'm, I'm going to play it. So, uh, his mouth might have carried on moving for a split second or so, like the proverbial headless chicken running around the yard, but no words came out. The man who'd spoken to him was half hidden behind the counter, but Paul could plainly see his round, perfectly circular bald head, balanced on top of a similarly spherical body, like a snowman. At the same moment, he remembered a name he'd been groping for at some point in the recent past. Mr. Paleologus, the toothbrush and antique princeman. Your dig, the round man repeated, his tone of voice making it clear that this was an order rather than a suggestion. No money. Present. He tipped coffee from a mug into a styrofoam cup and pressed on a lid. Also, more cake, he added. Custard slice is very popular. Many women in love with bad men come to eat. Make some fat but happy. He fished a slice off the tray with a big pair of steel tongs, dumped it in an open-ended cardboard box and slid the box into a paper bag. Enjoy! You are in love too, maybe. Take the mind off. Well, Paul thought, why not? He didn't wait for a reply, probably because, if it was at all accurate, it'd take way too long. Thanks, he said. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, there was no point asking, and he had more chance of getting a straight answer out of a cabinet minister, but he even so. Do I know you? You do now. Before, the man shrugged. It's possible. I've been here many years, many, many years. You don't sort of run a map and toothbrush shop in your spare time? The man looked at Paul as if he were drooling down his lapels. That was presumably a no. You don't have a twin brother or anything? The man shook his head. I come here from the old country, twenty-seven years ago. No brother, no sister, not even aunt or second cousin. Ah, right. One last try and then he'd done his duty to curiosity and could leave. The old country... Paul said. Where would that be exactly? Manitoba, the man replied. In the old days, before the war, we are dukes and counts and princes. Much land, much money. We live in great palace. Then the war come and poof. He's very sad. But, the man shrugged, he's very bad. But we come here. We make new life. It's not like old country. It's sheet compared to old country. But what do you do? Now you take coffee, you take cake. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Manitoba, Paul thought, as door swung shut behind him. 
It's all Miss Hook's fault, because if she hadn't been so horrible and so boring, maybe I'd have learned some geography and history and stuff back when I was eleven, and then I'd know where the hell Manitoba is. Counts and dukes and princes. That sounded sort of Eastern European. And of course, they were always having wars out that way. As he started to walk down the street, the book slipped out of its carrier bag and fell on the pavement. He stooped to pick it up. There was a dusty mark on the jacket, and one corner was bruised. Also, he'd contrived to drop a splodge of custard on the flyleaf. Wonderful. It was getting late. Miss Lertides would be wondering where the hell he'd got to. In spite of that, Paul got a taxi to Aldgate. As he rather expected, Mr Paleologus' his shop wasn't there any more. Then he headed back to the office. Mr Lertides didn't notice the damage to his book. He took it from Paul's hands, wrote out a pink slip so he could get the money back, then went on with the paperwork he'd been doing when Paul arrived. No, there wasn't anything else for now. Come back after lunch. Paul stood in the corridor for a couple of minutes, still holding his cake and his coffee, now stone cold and dribbling slightly from the air hole in the lid, trying to decide what he ought to do. It was difficult, mostly because he couldn't quite put his finger on where the problem lay. Last time it had been pretty straightforward. There had been an enemy, Countess Judy, and a clear and present danger. It had taken him quite some time to get involved, though not nearly as long as he'd have liked, but at least he'd known what the problem was. Now, though, he could tell something wasn't right, but this was G.A.W.W., where everything was different. Weird, not right at all. Trying to track down a problem here was like trying to find last year's rain in the ocean. And besides, it wasn't his problem, his fault, his responsibility. More the point, it wasn't anybody's fault. No, that wasn't strictly true. There was one person who'd failed in their duty, and who had to be made to put that failure right. If he could do that, he'd at least have a vague idea of where to look for the problem. Progress, as the deer said to the caveman who invented the bow and arrow. On the first floor landing, Paul nearly collided with Ricky Wormtorder. Paul had stopped to fish a bit of dust out of his eye in front of the mirror that hung there, and Ricky came, charging up the passageway like a prop forward. A last moment sidestep avoided serious impact damage, but most of Paul's coffee went down the front of his jacket. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ricky said. I wasn't looking where I was going. It doesn't matter, Paul replied. It was cold anyhow. And that's all right then, Ricky said. You'll feel it, aren't you? Frank Leertide's assistant. Don't think we've met before. I've been a bit tied up recently, out of the office a lot. Fifty-headed title had somehow managed to wriggle its way into the vaults of the Credit Leonie and Basile. Real bitch getting it done there without blowing up half the city. And you know how pernickety the Swiss can be. Eventually managed to flush it out with ultrasonic waves and nailed it the old-fashioned way. The old cold steel, as Lance Corporal Jones would say. How about you? Settling in? Uh, fine, thanks, Paul replied. I, I like it here. It's it's fun. Great. Ricky smiled at him and then caught sight of the paper bag in his hand. The paper had gone translucent in a couple of places and the telltale yellow of confectioner's custard was peeking through. What have you got to sell, then? Custard slice? Paul nodded. Mm, I love them, Ricky said, shifting his attention away from the bag with a slight but still perceptible effort. As they've got really great patisseries in Basil, of course, as you'd expect, but even so. I also reckon you can't beat a traditional English custard slice. Probably my favourite, and so it's a close call between that and the proper old fashions to keep on. A slight pause, as though Ricky were waiting for something. I actually, Paul said, you can have this one if you like. No, no, I couldn't. No, really, I've had one already, so it'd be just greedy. Please, be my guest. If Ricky fought dragons with the same ferocious energy he brought to battling with his conscience, no wonder the Credit Lyonnais had sent for him straight away. Oh, go on then. Ricky said, practically snatching the bag from Paul's hand. Thanks, that's very kind of you. I shall next time. I know this is really great little monogasque place that does a mean creme tart of oceresis. He hurried away down the stairs as though he was afraid that Paul would change his mind. Shaking his head, Paul went into his office. After a brief, futile attempt to sponge coffee off his jacket with a screwed up sheet of paper before it stained, he picked up the phone. Directory inquiries? Rather to his surprise, they were able to give him the number he wanted. He dialed it. It rang through. Holding his breath, he waited. Hello? The voice was thinner, radier, a little cracked, but Paul's mouth still went dry with fear. He screwed his eyes shut. Miss Hook? That's right. Who's this? Deep breath. Here we go. 
you won't remember me, Miss Hook, uh, he said, but my name's Paul Carpenter. I was in your class back in 91. You... Oh, I remember you, snarled Miss Hook. I remember you very well. You're always fidgeting, playing with bits of paper. You and that Demelza Horrocks. Ah, right, Paul said. Fancy you remembering me after all this time. Uh, anyway, there's something... Never paid attention, Miss Hook went on, as if he hadn't spoken. Weren't interested. Might as well have tried teaching a brick wall. Trying to get homework out of you was a waste of time. If I told you once, tuck your shirt tails in, straighten your tie, sit up straight. Miss Hook, Paul interrupted. I know I wasn't a very good student. That's putting it mildly. And I know I sort of missed out on a lot of stuff we did in class. In one ear, about the other. Don't know why I even bothered to try. Well, Paul said firmly, I realise now how stupid that was of me. And I'm really sorry. Really, I am. Pause. You called me up after all these years just to apologise? Yes, Paul said. Partly. Also, there were some things I know I missed, and I was just wondering if we could go over them now, make up for lost time, as it were. Paul felt he could hear the expression on her face. Isn't it a bit late for that? It's never too late, Miss Hook, Paul said. So, uh, would it be all right? Uh, there's just a few specific questions. It, it won't take long. All right. Though I really don't see what can be so important 13 years later. Oh, it's important, all right. Uh, first, some time later, Paul put the phone down. He was shaking slightly, and his breathing was forced and quick, but he had half a page of notes jotted down on a piece of paper in front of him. They'd cost him more than blood, more than breaking and entering his own worst childhood memories, but they were worth it. Now at least he actually knew something. He now knew that Manitoba was in Canada, and so was Saskatchewan. The Canada was first colonised by Westerners in the 16th century, although there'd been an abortive attempt nearly 600 years earlier, when a bunch of Vikings led by someone called Leif Erikson had briefly established a settlement in Labrador. But they'd given up and gone home almost immediately, and for the next six centuries the only inhabitants of Canada had been the indigenous tribes. Aside from a few skirmishes around 1814, the last war fought on Canadian soil had taken place back in the 18th century. There were a lot of French-speaking people in Canada, and they were proud of their cultural heritage, but Miss Hook hadn't been able to tell him if they had a distinctly French-Canadian school of cuisine, and even if they had, she'd pointed out, it wouldn't have been on the syllabus for 11-year-olds, though they might just possibly have touched on it in a project or something. She'd also told him a few things about himself at 11 years old that she thought might have slipped his mind, but he hadn't bothered taking notes about them. Paul read the paper through four or five times, his eyes skating over the scribbled words like a file on a hardened steel. Now at least he knew what was wrong. He had a faint shadow of an idea why it was wrong, also why Sophie had vanished and had been replaced by Colin the Goblin, who Mr Paleologus was, and why the office had appeared to be deserted when he'd got there that morning. All well and good, but he was no nearer the truth than, say, a 29th century archaeologist trying to extrapolate the whole of 21st century society from a cork bottle and a Barbie doll. What he couldn't figure out for the life of him was where Vicky the ex-mermaid or the sword he'd cut the cake with fitted in, or why Mr. Lairtides moved like second-rate computer animation, or why the TV anchorman's blood and the sword had saved him in the land of the dead. Without answers to these questions, he was no better off than he'd been before. He glanced at his watch. If he was quick and didn't bump into some chatty bastard on the way out, he could be through the front door before they bought it for the lunch hour. He was hungry, and he had an experiment he wanted to try. If only he was still on flirting terms with Mr Tannen's mum. But that would involve long, complex explanations, and probably a slap round the face with a leather-palmed scale-backed hand. Besides, there was no guarantee that the experiment would work, and if it failed, he'd be in no danger at all. There's never a bakery around when you want one. It felt like he'd been walking for hours before Paul finally stumbled across what he was looking for. A small, crowded sandwich bar under some railway arches, with a queue of office workers backed up to the street. When eventually he got to the head of the line, he saw what he'd been expecting to see. He smiled politely. Hello, he said. Your name wouldn't happen to be Paleologus, would it? The short, bold, round-headed man raised both eyebrows at him. He what? All right, then. You wouldn't happen to be one of a set of identical triplets. Huh? Paul shrugged. Never mind, he said. Thought I knew from somewhere. Can I have two custard tarts, a custard slice, a custard donut and a Danish pastry, please? What flavour Danish? Custard. The man handed them over in a paper bag. You like custard, don't you? No, Paul said. Well, I can take it or leave it. Thanks. Next he needed somewhere quiet and peaceful. 
Fortunately, he wandered into a small public garden in the middle of a square, some sad-looking flower beds surrounding a patch of threadbare grass with a few benches and a statue of some old general on a horse. It was still a bit public, and of course there was no prospect at all of any help if something went wrong, but that was only to be expected. Anyway, nothing was going to go wrong because the experiment wasn't going to work, was it? Paul began with the Danish, and nothing happened. Next he ate one of the custard tarts. It fell to bits as soon as he coaxed it out of its little foil cup, and a cascade of pastry shrapnels tumbled down his shirt front and onto his lap. The custard slice was messier still, and the custard doughnut squidged alarmingly under the pressure of his teeth, shooting sweet-smelling yellow goo up his nose. So far, so futile, and he was just starting to think what a prat he must look, sitting on a park bench on his own, gorging himself on cakes, when he looked up and noticed something. It was the green and brown bronze general on his anatomically impossible guano-streaked horse. Two minutes ago he'd been facing east. Now he was pointing due north. That was it. Nothing else. If Paul hadn't made a point of taking note of every little detail that might possibly be relevant, he'd never have noticed anything. Because who the hell pays any attention to mouldy old Victorian statues or gives a damn which way they're pointing? Nevertheless, he stood up and walked over to the statue and read the inscription on the plinth. Erected by public subscription in honour of His Royal Highness Louis Philippe the Twenty Second, Prince of Saskatchewan, Grand Duke of New Brunswick, Elector Palliative, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. Fine, Paul thought, so I proved my point. Now how the fuck am I supposed to get back out of here? Should have thought of that earlier chided the inner voice, which was pretty much the sort of remark he'd come to expect from it. He sat down heavily on the bench and tried to rally his thoughts, but he knew he was wasting his time. If this place was where he thought it was, he was beyond help. It wasn't like falling asleep on the bus and having to walk home from the terminus. This was a place he could never walk home from if he marched all day for a thousand years. Paul was, he knew perfectly well, approaching the problem from the wrong direction. That was another thing he knew. He'd really taken to this knowledge business, making up for lost time. Unfortunately, it was rather like the feeling you have in those dreams, where you're both the main player and the spectator, where you watch yourself doing something really stupid, but you can't tell yourself not to. And maybe that was the whole point, except, of course, he couldn't see it. Not from here. Over there. Over there, but invisible, sitting on precisely the same few square inches of this very bench, but looking at a mouldy old Victorian statue that faced east instead of north, was his old friend and worst enemy, Paul Carpenter. He could feel the smug bastard's eyes watching him, knew for a certainty that bloody Carpenter knew what ought to be done, and most likely do it himself, easy as sneezing, but he that couldn't be bothered was maliciously refusing to help. No. Paranoia. Paul Carpenter was in the same dream, the one where you watch yourself walking out into the unmarked minefield and yell warnings until your throat's rasp raw, but you can't seem to make yourself heard. It was infuriating, because Carpenter was only 90 or 270 degrees away, but without the right gadgetry or guaranteed stone-cold reliable method of cheating, damn Mr Tanner's monster goblin hell for taking the bloody thing from him just when he really, really needed it, he had no hope whatsoever of establishing contact between themselves. Semaphore wasn't going to get the job done, nor smoke signals, beacon fires, messages in bottles, skywriting, email, or standing on the bench shouting very loudly. Possibly, just possibly, if he set off walking in the opposite direction and kept on going right the way around the planet until, eventually, he came back to this exact spot and faced himself, as in a mirror. But there wasn't time for all that. No, it was a mess, and stupid Carpenter had got him into it. All Carpenter's fault. I wonder nobody had liked him in school. He still had what he knew. He'd won the knowledge the hard way, by living it. Not the easy way, reading it in a book or being told by someone who'd been in on a secret all along. he dug down deep to get it, as though he'd been retrieving someone else's buried treasure, with only a badly drawn, faded sketch where X marked the spot. And, of course, he'd wormed his way in here without giving any thought to how he was forced to get out again, because deep down he'd refused to believe that the experiment might work. After all, he'd been basing everything on a hypothesis figured out by a known idiot, someone only a fool would ever believe, but he still had what he knew for what that was worth. Hello, Paul. He recognised the voice. No need to turn his head and look at her. You, he said ungraciously. Should have expected you'd be here. Really? 
The voice was the same, but not the tone. Paul still thought of her primarily as Vicky the Mermaid, assuming that that was what she really was. Well, clever old you. What led you to that conclusion? Not exactly rocket science, was it? He thought aloud. The whole mermaid thing for a start. After all, what's the most salient feature of mermaids? Ooh, tricky one. Let's see. Big dreamy brown eyes. No. Nice smile. Long wavy hair. Great pair of... No. Good heavens, she said gravely. Don't say you look beyond the crudely obvious. Next thing you'll be thinking with your brain instead of your other very small organ. <laughs> Mermaids, Paul went on, transcend elements. They're half creatures of air and half creatures of water. That makes them special. True, Vicky said. Though the same goes for dolphins, also frogs. A frog special too. Doesn't matter, Paul said, because you aren't really a mermaid. She laughed, very slightly shrill. <laughs> Excellent, she said. Well done. How do you know? He carried on looking straight ahead. He had faith in the medicine, of course. He knew he couldn't really come to harm. We're catching nasty, visually transmitted emotional disorders. But it wasn't worth taking the risk. Your hair, he said. Dark brown with light streaks. Very distinctive. You like it? I recognised it. I knew I'd seen it before. That pattern or something really similar. But I couldn't remember. It, it's like the memory is a book. But where it ought to be on the bookshelf, there's a gap. I know there's a memory, but I don't know what it is, and if it's not there anymore, the likeliest explanation is that someone's taken it away. Vicky sighed. I hate that, she said. When someone borrows bits of my mind and forgets to give them back. You know, you're talking a real load of poo here. You think so? Paul shrugged. Trying to reconstruct what that memory might have been was a that was a real cow of a job. But then I saw that pattern again at Mr Tanner's mum's christening party. That's when you died, right? He nodded. That's when I died. But just before that, I had to cut the stupid cake. And guess what they gave me to cut it with? A bloody great big sword. Oh? Was it a big cake? Enormous. But that's not the point. The point was they gave me this sword, and the blade was a sort of plum brown colour, with these really cute silver whirls and tendrils and what have you. Not inlays or etched on or anything like that. They were right deep down in the metal. I think it's called demasculating. I may have seen it on a history documentary or something. Fascinating. What's that got to do with anything? And I was thinking, Paul went on, there's other things that transcend elements as well as mermaids. Swords, for instance. Not, he added, that I'm an expert. I mean, I could write out everything I know about metalworking in big capital letters on the back of a postage stamp and still have room for my name and address. But if I remember right from this history programme, I guessing I must have seen at some point, or else how would I know any of this shit? If I'm right, a sword starts off as iron, or deep in the ground, that's earth, and then it gets heated up until it's red hot, that's fire, and you get fire hot by blowing on it with a bellow, so that's air too. Technically, said Vicky, though I think you're pushing it. And then, Paul said, you make it hard and tough by dunking it in water. And there's your complete set. Earth, air, fire, water. A sword is equally at home in all four. Assuming you're counting air, Vicky objected. I still think that one's a bit iffy myself. I don't agree. I think a sword transcends all the elements, which is why I think when Viking warriors died, they always had their swords buried along with them. Because something that transcends elements is a something you can take with you, don't you think? Nah, I think it's because they hated their relatives, so they wanted to make sure they didn't leave them any nice stuff when they snuffed it. People can be so petty. I had an uncle. No, Paul said. I don't believe you ever had an uncle or any relatives of any sort. I think that when the goblins stabbed me at that party and I died, I took the sword with me, because swords transcend the elements. That's why I still had it in my hand when I woke up in that TV studio. And that must have been real, because there was real blood on it, just enough to keep me from fading away. TV studio? I never knew you'd been on the telly. I don't think I was, Paul replied. I think it was the goblin afterlife. I went there because I got killed by goblins. I'm a little bitty goblin myself, and a TV show where they play about the shittiest moments of your life and ask you to comment on them is exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to find the goblin hereafter. Which is why, he added with a slight shudder, I'm reasonably sure I didn't actually kill somebody even though I cut off that bloke's head. I don't think he was real. At the very most, he was some kind of goblin angel and I'm guessing he wasn't killed in any meaningful sense. You killed someone. Why would you do a thing like that? But, Paul went on, later on when I licked the blood off the sword, it was real blood. 
real enough to get me out of there. And that must have been because being in contact with the sword made it real. Because swords transcend the elements. They must do. Actually, he added, or else how could I have had a hand to hold it with when I just died? That's it. Must be. Touching the sword kept me real, or at any rate, real enough. Is that right? Is that how it works? What are you asking me for? Well... Paul said. You ought to know better than anybody. It was you, wasn't it? You're it. Brown hair with curly bright streaks in it, just like the patterns in the blade. You're the sword they gave me to cut the cake with. Well, aren't you? Pause. No, Vicky said. Deep in the smelly recesses of Paul's mind, a nasty thought stirred. The thought that he'd been barking up entirely the wrong tree, and he'd just made the nuttiest speech of his entire life to one of his work colleagues, who'd lose no time in telling everybody else around the office he was barking mad and very, very strange indeed. No, Vicky repeated, but you're close. Am I? Oh, good. Very close, actually. But you're wrong about that. I'm not a sword. I'm a girl. Oh, right. Uh, Sorry. Perfectly all right, I'm a girl, but the sword is my other half, she paused. Is none of this ringing any bells? No, Paul confessed. No, it isn't. Really? (sighs) She clicked her tongue. That ricky worm toter. Next time I see him, I'm going to kick his ass from here to Dagenham. Paul considered what she'd just said. A splendid idea and it's high time somebody did, but why? What's he got to do with anything? Vicky sighed. Because he was supposed to have told you all about it when he gave you the sword. Only, of course, obviously he didn't. Tell you, I mean. Or give you the sword, apparently, because didn't you just say the goblins gave it to you? Yes, uh, or rather, Paul added, it's just sort of appeared. Fell out of thin air, I assumed it came from them. He paused, something about the handle being wrapped in pink ribbon and goblins are allergic to pink. Presumably, he said, but whatever fact remains. Bloody worm has screwed up again. Nice enough bloke, quite cute, great bum, but about as reliable as a petrol station watch. It was just like that while we were married. Just, just a second, Paul couldn't help interrupting. You were married to Ricky Wormtoter. Another sigh. Don't rub it in, she said. Yep, Ricky and me, we go way back, but that's none of your business. I was explaining, she went on, about magic swords and other halves, but clearly I was boring you because... Sorry, 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 please go on. It's very interesting, really. Well, she began, but Paul wasn't listening. A memory was starting to bleed through the walls of his mind. A memory of himself and Ricky Worm taught us sitting together in a very strange pub, not long after the conclusion of the Hall Countess Judy business. Her name is Skoffnung, Ricky had told Paul, as he stared at the ferocious-looking sword that Ricky had just laid out on the table in front of him. Used to belong to King Rolf Kraki. Go on, take a closer look. That's a nice pattern, I think. Paul remembered how he'd gripped the scabbard with his left hand and pulled the blade out an inch or so. To his surprise, it wasn't bright and shiny. The blade was dark brown with intricate patterns of silver specks and whorls. Damascus steel. Ricky explained, or at least Paul guessed it was meant as an explanation. You never find two the same, which makes it easier, of course. Makes what easier? Ricky narrowed his eyes. Finding her, of course, he said. Then, I forgot, you obviously don't know. It's a living sword, right? Is it? I meant, right, yes, obviously. Ricky laughed. A living sword, he said, is special because it has a life of its own, which is good because it knows what it's doing when in use, so you don't have to. But it does mean that you have to find its other half before it's much good for anything. And, he added with a slight grimace, I have to admit, I never did find her. And without the other half, of course, it's pretty much useless. Other half. That's right. A living sword has a human counterpart. And once you find... Oh, excuse me. Ricky had stopped there and gone off to see someone he wanted to talk to, and he never got round to finishing the explanation. For his part, Paul had just about managed to override the very strong instinct that had urged him to find a river or canal to throw the horrible thing into, because no doubt Ricky would be mortally offended if he ever found out. Instead, he'd taken it home and shoved it away out of sight under the sofa, and never looked at it or thought about it since. "'I remember,' Paul said. "'Yes, that's right.' Excuse me? I remember, Paul repeated. I remember, I remember, I remember. There was a sword. Ricky Wormtoter did give it to me in a pub just after. Fine, Vicky said. 
That's all right, then. You've just saved Ricky from a very unpleasant experience, which would, just for once, have been entirely undeserved. I wish you'd remembered it earlier. Saved me a whole lot of explaining, and... That was it, Paul said. The memory I knew I'd had but couldn't find. The one I was looking for. It was Ricky and me in that pub. He frowned. Implications and logical conclusions and all sorts of other horrible things were swooping around his head like killer bats. In which case, he said, how the hell did it come to be falling out of the air at the christening? It should still be on my floor, covered in dust and bits of fluff. You mean you don't hoover regularly under the sofa? I'm shocked. What would your mother think if she knew? And your... Who, bloody Ray, we finally got there in the end. Yes, I'm the other half Ricky told you about. He did tell you about that, didn't he? Paul nodded. He said he could never use a sword because, well, he never found you. Asshole. Vicky said succinctly. Never bothered looking more like. Anyway, here we are. And yes, you were right. At least as far as you went. You survived the christening party because my other half kept you real. Because it transcends elements, as you so elegantly put it. Actually, you'd be amazed at how many perfectly ordinary everyday objects do exactly the same thing. Not just swords. Humdrum kitchen appliances that you take for granted. Every bit as good, and the only reason Viking heroes weren't buried with electric kettles and fridge freezers is that they hadn't been invented yet. But you're on the right lines at last. Slowly, painfully, by incredibly torturous routes, a bit like a second-class letter. But you're getting there. The only question you don't seem to have addressed yet is, why didn't you pay attention in history and geography when you were at school? Oddly enough, precisely the same question had just crossed Paul's mind, and so remarkable was the coincidence that he broke his resolution and looked around at her, except she wasn't there any more. She had gone, and he was alone on a bench in a small public garden with a mouldy old Victorian statue of an East Fierce man on a horse. East Fierce in. Now that was what mattered. Everything else, swords, mermaids, elements transcended or otherwise, goblins, decapitated TV anchormen, and even our Doomler, the great cow of heaven, was just... Trivia compared to the single joyful fact that the mouldy statue's horse's head, on which a rather disreputable-looking pigeon had just landed, was pointing due east rather than due north. I'm back, Paul thought. Back from exactly where I am right now. Isn't that just the most amazing thing ever? His legs were weak and wobbly when he put his weight on them, and he staggered a few times before they started working it again. But he took no notice. The first priority was to get the hell out of there, as far away from the mouldy old statue on the bench and the small public garden as he could go before his strength gave out and he fell over. In the event, he found he had underestimated himself. He contrived to stay upright as far as a bus stop and rested for a minute or so, hanging from the concrete stand. Then a bus seemed to materialise out of nowhere, and by some freaky chance it happened to be going to some merry axe. By some equally weird coincidence, the driver was a short, bald man with a perfectly spherical head resting on top of a minimalist neck and a wide slough of chins like an egg on an egg cup. Paul fetched up outside number 70 on the stroke of two o'clock. Perfect. He'd escaped from wherever the hell it was his insane curiosity had led him into, and he wasn't even late for work. He wasn't wobbling at all when he strolled through the door and passed reception. There you are, bloody last. Mr Tanner's mum wasn't at her usual place behind the front desk. Instead, her son was standing in the doorway, with a scowl on his face that stripped away Paul's feeling of vague euphoria, like fairy liquid cutting through grease. Where the hell have you been? We thought you'd skip the country or something. Not fair, wailed Paul's inner child. So not fair. But it's just gone too, I'm not late, he started to protest. But the words never got past customs, because before he'd got as far as just, the front door slammed and four very large goblins stepped up behind him and twisted his arms behind his back. Paul opened his mouth to yell at the pin, but fear muted out his voice. There was something very wrong here, far worse than sloppy timekeeping. Mr Tanner was staring at him as though he was trying to remove his liver and spleen just by looking. Not good at all. Well, said Mr Tanner. It took Paul a moment to remember how his mouth worked. Sorry, he said. I don't understand. You don't. Is that right? Mr Tanner flared his nostrils. A goblin thing, Paul assumed. He could do it himself, sometimes, a bit. Well, in that case, I'd better bring you up to speed. It's Dietrich Wormtoat up. Dietrich? Oh, Ricky. What about him? He's dead. Dead? Dead what? Dead lucky? Dead annoying? Vicky the non-mermaid had thought at some stage he was dead cute, but apparently not any more. Or could Mr Tanner possibly mean... Dead? Mr Tanner lifted and lowered his head slowly. Dead. In his office. 
His little round eyes glowed with a flash of the genuine goblin red. He was murdered. But, 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 Paul cut off the word before he chalked on it. Did you just say... Poisoned, Mr Tanner said. Absolutely no doubt. But, 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 Paul couldn't move enough to gesture his disbelief because of the goblins holding on to his arms. That's so... Have you got any idea who might have done it? Oh, yes. We know who did it all right, and we've got all the proof we need. Paul waited for a second, but Mr Tanner just carried on glaring at him. So he asked, Go on, then. Who was it? Mr Tanner grinned like an open wound. You.